Thank you everyone for joining us on this afternoon or morning, however it may be. Uh, on behalf of Interdisciplinary Center for Research and Curriculum, I welcome you to this wonderful talk that we have a chance to partake by Dr. Rula Hawa. I will introduce uh, Rula to you by mentioning that she's the Assistant Professor in the Department of Family Studies and Human Development at Russia University College uh, here at Western University, where she's involved in teaching and research. A certified teacher by training, Rula has taught in Ontario public uh, education system uh, in continuing teacher education for over 15 years. She brings a unique interdisciplinary background in education, health science, and family studies, providing her with a strong background in application of social science theories to public health scholarship. Dr. Hawa's research is community engaged with a focus on health equity of vulnerable population. Uh, populations, sorry, using arts-based and arts-informed inquiry methodologies and critical feminism, anti-colonial frameworks. Her research program is funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research, Canadian Foundation for AIDS Research, and um, CIRHR, Canadian HIV Trials uh, Network. And Rula, welcome please share your work with us. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tatiana. Thank you for the invite, uh, I guess, to Dr. Rachel Hayden, uh, who was the interim director last year. And uh, I know uh, I haven't had the chance to meet with uh, Dr. Kachabau. So uh, I'm uh, excited to be presenting today. Thank you all for attending. Uh, and I have to give credit for this beautiful flyer to Tatiana <laughs> for designing this uh, really good uh, flyer that I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with. Uh, so again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rula Hawa. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in family studies and human development at Russia University College. Uh, and uh, the title of my presentation is Mobilizing Change Through Curriculum, Engaging with Vulnerable Populations Through Participatory Action Research. Okay, I would like to start us off with an acknowledgement of the land. Uh, I know we are existing in virtual spaces. It can be easy to forget that we're all very reliant on our physical locations. Uh, I'll start us off with the acknowledgement. As an immigrant and settler on this land, I'm joining you in this presentation from the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Nunapewak, and other wandering peoples, all of whom have long-standing relationships to the land of Southwestern Ontario and the city of London. Uh, here's uh, the agenda or a presentation outline. Uh, I'll start with a very short background literature on the need for housing for women experiencing violence and participatory action research. Uh, I will uh, delve into the community university partnership that resulted in, in this project, uh, research questions that we attempted to address. Uh, or answer uh, the curriculum. Uh, I'll go over what kind of curriculum we used, uh, uh, methods for data collection, secondary and primary. Study findings will be limited only to the recommendations in the interest of time. And then uh, study impact, uh, the impact of the study on the community and the student. Uh, conclusions, lessons learned, and I'll leave the Q&A till the end. So I'm hoping to leave maybe uh, 15 minutes if I'm able to. I think I've uh, planned the right amount of material. So hopefully uh, the last 15 minutes will be for Q&A. So a bit of background uh, literature, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, basically brought about new challenges. So I have to give you context uh, for the study later on that it actually did take during COVID. But in general, the uh, pandemic brought new challenges to providing support to victims of uh, male violence and keeping individuals safe. Uh, COVID-19 intensified uh, existing harms uh, for women experiencing domestic violence and presented new challenges for service providers. Uh, and I guess the main challenge is the lockdown where uh, uh, women and, and, and girls and families who were locked down and, and, and stayed at home uh, increased the risk for women and children living in those homes, particularly with the abusers and definitely impacted their ability to access uh, shelters and services. 
uh, the pandemic impacts have been described as a perfect storm for domestic violence against women, resulting in isolation from support networks, heightened stress, loss of employment, and uncertainties over what services remain open and safe. I know services were not always open in the beginning and figuring out all that online life was difficult. Furthermore, the pandemic produces conditions that may impede reporting and definitely delay survivors access to support. So when we're looking at uh, the housing crisis in general, uh, results from the second nationally coordinated point in time count of homelessness in the Canadian communities indicates that there are fewer women-specific emergency shelter beds across Canada. In fact, 68% of shelter beds are either co-ed or dedicated to men, and compared to only 13% that are dedicated to women. So clearly there's a lack of women-specific housing and supports, and that shortage drives women into emergency shelters and services that may not recognize the women's uh, needs. They don't see them as homeless. Uh, they're not designed to respond to the unique needs of the women are not often under are often underfunded and overwhelmed and as a result many women remain trapped in traumatizing situations of homelessness and violence so here's a quick overview of uh, the project uh, so um the focus of this presentation, uh, today's presentation, is on, on the project that came to light out of a real community need. Uh, it resulted in a partnership between a family studies program at Russia University College and housing services in the city of London, community leaders working in the uh, sector and uh, in the city of London, Ontario. Uh, innovative curriculum was used to educate the students on the current local issues and strategies were developed to influence policy. And, and these are some of the things that I would like to share with you in today's presentation. So the approach used was a very much a participatory action research approach. Uh, we used a critical inquiry method that engaged all the groups in the process in a very collaborative uh, manner. And knowledge was uh, often uh, co-constructed and, and there was a communal process in constructing that knowledge. The goal was making grounds for transformative change. Uh, and, and as we all know, capturing that transformative change is often difficult and challenging. Uh, it was an organic process. There was an authentic community university partnership. Uh, the goal was to educate the students on the local issues. In, in our case was the gender-based violence in the city of London and to develop strategies uh, around policy or at least to contribute to policy relating to housing and gender-based violence. So I refer to this as an experiential learning opportunity. It started as an experiential learning opportunity in the classroom, uh, but it continued. As you can see from the dates, uh, we started in October 2020. The project uh, is still ongoing. Uh, so how did this project start? I saw a valuable opportunity for experiential learning in my undergraduate class uh, focused on diversity and the Canadian family. This is an undergraduate class that I teach at Russia. I wanted to provide my students uh, with an opportunity to engage in their own learning. Uh, so uh, um, there was a, a partnership that developed with London Community Recovery Network. And uh, at the time, because the course took place during COVID, uh, clearly the course was taught uh, online because there was no other way of, of teaching the course. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the opportunity arose with the uh, partnership with the London Community Recovery Network to engage the class. Uh, the network has identified uh, a number of short-term ideas to engage the class. And uh, one of them was a uh, shortage of housing and particularly the housing crisis for women experiencing gender-based violence. Uh, I jumped on the idea. I thought that was a great idea. And I think what was really important is it was a part of London's strategic plan. So which meant there's a real and authentic need for this work. And I thought, uh, this is great. That's a great opportunity for the students to work on something that the city needs. And hence the, uh, the partnership developed. So the first thing, part of this process is co-creating those research questions. Uh, so how does the housing system meet the needs of women and girls fleeing violence? So to, to go through this co-creation piece, there were a lot of meetings that took place. Uh, and uh, to honor the participatory approach, 
uh, we sat, uh, a team of us, uh, including myself and, and particularly uh, uh, housing services in the city of London, to look at what does the city need and, and what is feasible in terms of involving the students in something that's authentic and real and achievable as well within the uh, time that they are involved in the course, not knowing that this will actually continue for two years. Uh, so it was very important that we, we do that co-creation uh, process. The second uh, question that we looked at is what special support should be put in place to help women and girls fleeing violence access and retain housing? And the third research question, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the risk for family violence and access to needed uh, housing services? So here's a timeline uh, that I'm sharing with you uh, to show you the phases that the project went through. Um, so as you can see in, in phase one, and, and things really started early in the planning. So there's a ton of planning and work that goes behind the scenes before you provide those opportunities. Uh, the partnership was formed in October 2020, and uh, an expression of interest was sent by housing services to facilitate the work uh, to uh, sector leaders and the uh, gender based. So these are leaders already working in the city of London. And uh, the memo indicated, you know, there's a class, there's uh, someone interested, a professor interested in the work. Do you think you're able to participate in, in this initiative? Uh, so uh, we had uh, an overwhelming interest of around 10 leaders uh, from the sector who said, yes, we're, we're definitely interested in contributing. Um, phase two was data collection, and, and I'll walk you through uh, the, the different phases. I think the mostly the focus will be on phase two for today. Uh, so we did secondary data, so that was the gap analysis. There was primary data, these were interviews, and the interviews were with uh, sector leaders. And uh, then there's analysis and, and report writing. Uh, in my planning for, for the course, I wanted to make sure that I'm disrupting the curriculum. Uh, I see the curriculum as a process, uh, it's dynamic, it evolves. I didn't want my planning to be confined within the semester. Uh, I didn't want this to be a project that would end with the, with the course. And I think the fact that the uh, city uh, was helping with making the connections helped the project to continue. So uh, I was very grateful for that. So I, as you can see here, this is the timeline. Um, as you can see in, in the uh, bottom right-hand corner, IKT and IKT in, in the language of research is integrated knowledge translation, which means we translate the uh, data that we get throughout. We don't wait until the project ends. There's always translation of some of those findings and, and there's the engagement piece, which is extremely important when you're doing something like participatory action research, when you're involving a lot of partners. And as I mentioned, the focus today is on phase two. So this is, again, I'm not going to go with all the uh, tiny details, but this is an overview of what the planning took place and what kind of planning took place. So preparing all of that for the students in the semester took really months of work prior to the beginning of the semester because I had to make sure all the players are on board. And we, we didn't know, to be honest, whether you know all the players will be on board. I mean, people were strapped for time. It was during the pandemic. So it was challenging times. And uh, again, the easiest way of, of getting that done during a pandemic is to bring the community to class. Uh, that required a lot of prior learning and, and planning, as I uh, indicated. Uh, the community, the uh, leaders from the sector did actually respond to the invite and, and they were willing to give time and support to the students. Uh, as you can see, I mean, in addition to everything else in the course, um, these were uh, synchronous sessions and each session is three hours. So it's hard. I had 51 students in the class. And on top of that, I had the leaders the, from uh, the, the VOW network. I had the city. Uh, I had City Studio, who's an organization that helps bridge some of those uh, partnerships as well. So I had something like 60 something bodies, at least close sometimes to 70 uh, people in, in, in that forum. So it was uh, you know, quite a bit to, to navigate. 
as you can see, uh, uh, again, this is just a very quick overview. Uh, during those uh, visits, uh, there's an initial visit from uh, the city uh, of London staff. And then visit two, I prepare the students so that they can work on their project. And, and uh, they come back and they met uh, with the students with uh, uh, definitely via Zoom, uh, all those uh, rooms that we, we met in, trying to navigate all this new technology technology again that was also challenging so breakout rooms was was one of my best friends during uh, that time and uh, students were in, in in groups and they met uh, with their groups to get feedback from the city because they're the experts the bow leaders were the experts so they were firsthand working with the students there's more feedback from myself and then as you can see uh, towards the end that was their third visit to my classroom and uh, in their third visit they gave feedback on the final project uh, there were some recommendations that the power leaders provided so making sure the analysis is aligned the language is proper so all of that work happened during class so methods and data collection uh, again uh, there was secondary research so uh, the secondary research involves needs assessment environmental scan that the students did uh, primary research involved interviews with community leaders and again uh, as i mentioned these were community leaders in the sector and then final reports writing secondary data analysis in particular around situation analysis so something was really helpful from the city is they gave us access to uh, programs and, and databases to the students so the class had access not only to websites that are available publicly but also to programs uh, that they were offered particularly to attend to uh, women who are experiencing gender-based violence and housing. And uh, students worked with this humongous amount of data set. They reviewed websites and programs and organized them into themes. And uh, they basically conducted a gap analysis. So they addressed the question, what are some of the unmet housing needs of women and girls in the London Middlesex area who are fleeing violence? Students uh, listed issues that are important based on programs in London Middlesex. They also uh, organized their data, determined what emerged as areas of concern. So that was the secondary data uh, set uh, that is part of the study. Also, the study involved primary data collection, and uh, in order for the students to conduct interviews, they had to be trained. And uh, so our research officer, uh, along with myself and uh, a small team from the community, we trained the students on interviewing skills. How do you interview properly uh, sector leaders? Uh, students also completed ethics modules and received a certificate. A lot of our students in their first year uh, they undergo that training, but I wanted to make sure that they all have those certificates to know how do you ethically work with participants. Uh, so that was important and was a requirement of this project. And also uh, another thing that I went over and beyond is I actually applied for full ethics approval, knowing that this is a community work. I didn't want it to be just within the confines of the classroom. So I went through the whole full process of ethics approval. Uh, and of course that took months of time and, uh, and uh, I got a release from Russia Research Ethics Board to conduct the study. So in-depth interviews, uh, very important, uh, again, honoring the spirit of the uh, uh, collaborative pieces in, in action research, we co-created a semi-structured interview guide. So that was with the help of the uh, city staff, uh, particularly housing and, and experts in the field. Uh, so we uh, looked at the gaps. So we bridged the secondary data uh, that the students basically from the research. And we looked at that to inform the questions so that we would understand what kind of questions we need to ask about uh, sector leaders. Uh, a total of 12 volunteer leaders from the sector participated in in-depth interviews. This was all during in the midst of COVID, so everything was done virtually. In-depth interviewing took between 60 to 75 minutes. Um, so one particular uh, way of, of uh, basically uh, uh, making the, designing the uh, 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 interview guide is to follow a, a SWOT analysis. So uh, what we did is uh, in that particular interview, Bao leaders shared their thoughts on, on how the local housing system is meeting or not meeting the needs of women and, and girls fleeing violence. Uh, the interview guide followed a SWOT analysis. So meaning 
students asked uh, the leaders about leaders during the interview about strengths, what processes or programs in the city of London are working well, uh, weaknesses, what could be improved, what was done poorly, what should be avoided, what did not work. Students also asked about opportunities, what special support should be put in place to help women and girls fleeing violence or access and retain housing. Uh, do you see any opportunities that are missed and probably you know, we need to kind of work on? What would you do in order to be more effective in the future? Students also asked about threats. What are some of the barriers and threats to the housing system and meeting the needs of the women? And then what obstacles are women and girls facing and what needs to be done uh, in preparation for post-pandemic times? And the last point, which is what I'll be sharing today is the recommendations. Uh, we've shared findings from this work in different venues at CSSE 2022, uh, Canadian Association for Studies in Adult Education. Uh, and, and we share different parts of the study and, and different findings. And today I'm only sharing the recommendations. And uh, so the importance about those recommendations is these are not recommendations we put forward. These are recommendations provided by the leaders and we kind of collated them with the help of the London Abuse Women Center, which becomes our significant partner. And I'll talk about that in a second. So again, uh, as I mentioned, the focus on today's presentation is just on the recommendations. I'll let you uh, take a, a, a minute to look at the study recommendations. I'm going to walk you through those recommendations one by one briefly. Uh, very significant about those recommendations is after the course ended, London Abuse Women Center leadership team approached me and said, we want to be on this project. And they helped with their expertise. And, and we sat down and we said, OK, we've got all, all this data. What do we do with it? And we came up with this nine set of recommendations built directly on uh, what the city staff um, recommended, the leaders. So I'm just going to give you one minute to do that. And I'll talk about them one by one. Okay, so let's take a look at those recommendations. Uh, the first recommendation, again, these are all provided by the uh, leaders in the city. Uh, the first recommendation is ongoing opportunities to be provided by the City of London to engage women and girls with lived experience. And uh, as we all know, leaders can provide recommendations, but the voice of women with the lived experience really is, is significant. Uh, so something very important that the voices of women when the city came up with their strategies for creating a safe London for women and girls and with their strategic planning, uh, they involved uh, women and girls with lived experience in, in that initiative. So one of the recommendations that's coming from the leaders is basically they're asking the city to continue to engage the, the women in other of opportunities. So not only in determining what the uh, uh, initiatives are and, and what the strategic planning is, but also to uh, keep going with opportunities for them to make sure their voices are always heard. Another recommendation is funding to be provided by the City of London for priority access to housing, shelter, and community services for women and girls fleeing violence. So as we all know, the risk of further violence to women and, and children increase when they're not, they don't have immediate access to safe shelter and housing. So the recommendation, the main recommendation was the city needs to provide funding to ensure immediate access to shelter and housing with community support specific to the needs of abused and trafficked women and girls. Third area is prioritizing funding to immediate access to long-term or longer-term trauma-informed counseling. So uh, they were very big on the importance of counseling. And while the women are waiting to get to be uh, placed in houses, they need counseling. So that was a very important area. So City of London must prioritize the safety of women. Again, uh, they do that by making sure that they fund immediate access to organizations that provide trauma-informed long-term counseling, survivor center support. So it was important that funding be provided for those organizations. And the city can work at all levels of government. That was always something that I heard throughout the study is we need to involve all levels of government, not just city, but also the province and, and federal uh, money as well. And the whole idea is to provide stable and long-term funding. Third uh, recommendation is to, to have proactive policies. And, and we know policies can drive change, planning and development for better housing infrastructure to be implemented. So City of London is encouraged to work on all levels, again, of government 
proactively plan and develop policies to improve infrastructure and, and infrastructure. The leaders talked about shelters, housing, and, and develop strategies to, to address the post traumatic or, or post pandemic, uh, rather, sorry, increased demand. So how are we making sure there are policies that are responsive to the needs of women? Investment to be made for a public awareness campaign. Uh, the leaders talked a lot about that. Uh, as we know, um, there needs to be a recognition. We know that the research says it, but not necessarily there is a lot of uh, public awareness around it that housing crisis disproportionately affects women and girls particularly women and girls who are facing gender-based violence. So City of London encourages, again, is encouraged to develop a public awareness campaign uh, just to increase community knowledge around those issues. Uh, landlords need education and training. So uh, one of the recommendations is uh, landlords need to be willing to provide survivors with safe housing. And, and often a lot of the women are faced with obstacles with not finding housing because landlords don't want to have tenants uh, who are women or survivors and their young children. Another important piece that's important around public awareness is uh, nonprofit agencies not only rely on funding, but also sometimes get uh, a lot of funds through fundraising. So creating an awareness around the issue is very important. Provide emergency shelter, uh, again, specific to the needs of women and girls. Uh, during the pandemic, a lot of the women and girls were housed in hotels and motels. And, and the issue with that is uh, it also, uh, you know, they're known places. And when they're known places, you know, abusers or uh, sex trafficking, uh, they, they, you know, they can actually know where they are and they can target them because they're in hotels and motels. Uh, so what were they recommending the leaders are safe houses, uh, and, and those would have security, 24-hour staffing. Uh, again, adequate funds for food. It looks like a lot of the women who are fleeing violence and looking for housing and in transition, they don't have basic funds for food and, and just basic needs. And uh, a, a very important area was also uh, with meeting the cultural needs of uh, newcomers uh, with London and, and other areas of Ontario, like Greater Toronto Area, Hamilton, um, Windsor, uh, Waterloo, London. So there are a lot of newcomers and refugees. And what they're saying here is city must ensure shelter housing. It has culturally appropriate services and supports, and also making sure those services are in the women's first language. Increased safety and affordability of long-term housing. That's an important area they talked about is the stigma. Uh, a lot of those subsidized housing are clustered and people know that this is the area where the subsidized housing is. Uh, so not only there's stigma, but often those places are not convenient in terms of accessing public transit. So for this reason, there's a recommendation to have those houses dispersed in the city. Uh, also uh, promoting new developments. Uh, so putting perks for new developments to make sure that there's some units that are you know, fairly affordable. And then look into funding long-term housing because the issue with women accessing those shelters and staying in the shelters for long periods of time is that you're actually not allowing other women to access those shelters. Addressing lack of services for male perpetrators of abuse and violence against women and girls. And again, th that came from a few of our leaders saying that uh, there needs to be early intervention for male perpetrators. So not only the women, but also look at the male perpetrators. And uh, this seems to be a little bit radical, but it has a lot of merit to it. Justice system may be moving to order the men or the males to, to leave the home as opposed to the women. So the women and their families and their kids stay, and then making sure that the men are somewhere in a shelter for male abusers. And, and for this reason, just kind of flipping the coin and making it slightly different. Provide training on being trauma-informed to housing and homeless prevention staff. And, and one of the recommendations is making it mandatory for, to train all city staff on providing trauma-informed services. And the reason for that is that it creates more sensitivity towards serving the women. They can help them navigate some of those complex forms to access housing if they're sensitive to the needs of somebody who's exposed to trauma. So that trauma-informed uh, training is, is critical. And also st uh, staff training uh, in terms of uh, particularly those uh, who provide uh, services to increase staff capacity, so making sure that they have that lens while serving the woman. 
So what is the impact of this project on community and students? So I'll start you off with student impact because this was facilitated by a partnership through City Studio uh, London at the time, at least in, in the beginning, uh, students were uh, to share some of those findings and this is the integrated knowledge translation uh, through a, a really a conglomeration of, of other student groups and community and the city. And Hubbub is an event uh, that basically has all of that so city staff are there the mayor is there uh, a lot of nonprofit organizations are there funders uh, student groups so uh, students in my class we picked a group and uh, so they presented uh, their work uh, they made it called they called it out of the frying pan and into a home uh, they created a poster and uh, again with the hope that this project can create some awareness so these are some quotes from the students. Uh, students talked about capacity building. Uh, this experience has provided me with uh, an increased network that in turn has increased the likelihood that I'll be able to obtain employment in London. So these are some quotes from the students. Uh, also, because of integrated knowledge translation, uh, because of the students presenting in the city, uh, there was an awareness around the media, which is really an impact that we were hoping for. Uh, so an article was written around the project. Uh, here's one of my students from the class, uh, Jessica Basso, and uh, she interviewed, they interviewed me as well. And uh, basically the uh, article talked about precious students aiding City Hall and helping victims of domestic violence. Coverage for course participatory action research project developed in partnership with City Studio London for the diversity and the Canadian family course. And here's a quote from Jessica. Um, I love the opportunity, uh, Jessica said, it's not just about earning a grade at the end, it's more getting that opportunity to make a difference, even if it is a small difference. Uh, another uh, impact of the project had to do with the community. So uh, one of the uh, two of the leaders from the violence against women uh, sector from the leaders that were interviewed uh, asked if they could be on a podcast and I took that opportunity. Uh, Brescia was running a, a, a podcast that is a four part series about how women have been affected by and responded to the pandemic. Uh, and there's the link for you here. Um, so um, uh, again, the focus of this podcast was on gender-based violence. I connected with two of the leaders uh, and, and uh, one colleague from uh, Dr. Jordan Furban from uh, the sociology department at King's uh, also uh, uh, co-hosted with me the, uh, the two leaders. So we talked to Jackie Seeler, uh, who's the chair of the uh, London Homeless Coalition and Jesse uh, Roger, who's the executive director of ANOVA in London. And they both offered very valuable insights in terms of housing and gender-based violence. More impact is, has to do with uh, political action uh, with the support of the London Abuse Women Center leadership team. Uh, as I said, after the course ended, we uh, continued uh, we continued the work. Uh, so they encouraged me to put a policy brief and we did. So we took the nine recommendations that we uh, compiled together and uh, we sent a request to the city to appear as a delegation. And the committee that handles that is the city strategic planning and policy committee uh, to present our findings. So we basically asked them, we shared the findings in, in a policy, the recommendations, and we asked for a delegation status to be granted. And here's just the minutes from uh, the city, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, we requested for delegation status and delegation status actually was granted. More on community impact, the outcome. So the focus of the work is on uh, LOX Survivor Advisory Committee. So what we did in year two, as I mentioned, it did not stop with the course ending. So in year two, uh, we focused on uh, the LOX Survivors Advisory Committee. And again, without the London Abuse Women Center, we could not have engaged with the community to this extent. We could not have made a difference in terms of the policy and, and presenting to the city. So the community has to buy into those initiatives. And because it was authentic, because it came from a real need, 
uh, the community believed in it. And I think that was a very critical component in, in this particular project. So in year two, Locke said, based on one of, one of the recommendations to make sure voices of women are heard, uh, Locke has a survivor's advisory committee. Uh, and uh, they actually said, we can train the students to work and interview uh, and, and that's year two. We have not presented yet uh, those findings because we are, we're still collating the results. Uh, so they said, why don't the students get involved with the Survivors Advisory Committee? They will interview them. And, and this way, we not only hear from the leaders, but we also hear from the survivors themselves. So the second year uh, in the project, uh, we had something came out positive out of this uh, city, uh, the delegation status presentation. We got a member from the councillors, councillor Phil Squire, who came the following year. So that was winter 2021. And he came to my class in winter 20 and fall 2021. And he presented to the students. And, uh, you know, he said that he believes in the project. He's also a lawyer. Uh, and I don't believe he's still in, in city council. But also something really positive came out of this is a counselor who listened on to our presentation when we presented and we had that delegation status is uh, uh, Councillor Elizabeth Peloza, who's running, so I can put a plug for Elizabeth. She's running for Ward uh, 12, and, uh, uh, and she actually came to class along with uh, staff from LOC to train the students in terms of trauma-informed interviewing skills, how do you deal with vulnerable populations, ethics, of course, and, and we extended our uh, ethics approval for the project. So final thoughts, lessons learned, um, there needs to be an organic process. If you're doing participatory action research, it needs to be an organic process stemming from a real need. Um, there needs to be a need to engage all the groups. That, that's important. Uh, it has to be collaborative. Uh, knowledge needs to be co-constructed. You need an innovative curriculum uh, to capture that. So you need to have all the players engaged in a, a, a really a process that is kind of set and known. You need to have built-in strategies for impacting policy. At least we hope, we tried with creating the awareness with the brief that we had with the follow-up from the city council. Uh, Elizabeth Beloza is the one who handles the funding uh, for the city. So that's also uh, good for us in terms of uh, accessing extra funds. You need time and energy. <laughs> this work is really, really very tiring. If you're thinking just to teach a course and, and uh, yeah, that's not, not the way to do it. And the, the result, which is really very rewarding is an authentic partnership. So that's, that's always a good thing. Uh, conclusions, uh, power of curriculum. Um, in conclusion, our team believes in the power of curriculum and effective change. The process is organic. It resulted in an authentic community university partnership. We used innovative curriculum to educate students on current local issues. Uh, the students were interested. They, they bought into the process because it's authentic. The community was really engaged in it. We developed strategies to influence policy. At least the strategies are there. And definitely the work continues. I would like to acknowledge the help of all the key partners. Uh, the, the, out, the outgoing, uh, who's now a retired executive director, Megan uh, Walker from uh, LOC, London Abuse Women's Center, uh, and, and Jennifer Dunn, who was the incoming but was associate director for many years. Uh, I still work with Jennifer and, and the LOC team. We're still collaborating. We collaborated on presentations. We collaborated on, on papers, on second year, continuing the work and the process. Could not have done it without their help. Uh, and their partnership. So Jennifer Dunn, Sandra Lynn Coulter, Wendy Goldsmith, May Said, uh, Patty Brindle from London Abuse Women's Center. We've got uh, key people, Chris Green and Kathy Parsons from the Economic Partnership City Planning, City of London. We've got housing services in City of London, City Studio London staff, all the leaders in the Violence Against Women Network in London Middlesex, Russia University College, all the students who were open to this uh, engaging project and time consuming project. And, and I need to mention two of my students, Riti Chopra, who volunteered on the project in year one after the uh, course ended and, and continued to work with me. And she also was one of our co-presenters. And currently I have uh, Mana Charma, who is uh, the uh, work study student who's continuing the work for the second year at, as a student, uh, paid student by Brescia. And 
that is the end of this presentation. I'm more than happy, I have my email. I'm more than happy to share resources. I've got a research package, a thick one with every task being uh, scaffolded to allow the students step-by-step -step to know what are the things to happen, what is the training that's needed. Uh, and uh, you can uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm not a very regular Twitter poster, but I post some highlights. So if you have any questions and I'm gonna leave it now, open it up for Q&A.